So, the history of Earth, the very seriously abridged version. Four and a half billion years ago, the just now beginning to cool Earth is struck by a large planetary body from further out in the solar system, and it re-melts the Earth. And that planetary body combines with the material of Earth, Earth gets a little bit bigger, and the remaining material begins to form a disk around Earth. And over time that cools and forms into our moon. So 4.5 billion years ago, the moon essentially formed on Earth. Now, half a billion years later, the Earth cools enough to start to form liquid water. Now that's kind of contested. Some people will say, some geologists will say 4.28 billion years ago we had liquid water, and some will say 3.8. Regardless, somewhere in that time, the Earth cools enough that water is able to go from vapor to liquid form, and we start to form ponds, oceans, so on and so forth. Now, as soon as we get liquid water, the first form of life basically appears. About 3.8 billion years ago, again, this is contested a little bit. It's within about 500 million years, but we, all, we for the most part, agree that life began about 3.8 billion years ago. Now, that life wasn't anything impressive. It was single-celled organisms, and it was basically floating around in some weird soup of, you wouldn't want to swim in the water. We'll just put it that way. So. Life forms 3.8 billion years ago, and it stays single cell organism for a very, very long time. In fact, algae doesn't even begin to form until 1.2 billion years ago, right? So that's that, that slimy stuff that forms in the tops of ponds. Yeah, that was the most complicated thing, living creature on Earth, most complicated living creature in our galactic neighborhood, all the way up until 1.2 billion years ago. Think about that for a second. All right, moving on. About half a billion years later, we get into the Cambrian period, and this brings us to the Cambrian explosion. And during this time, we go from single cell to slightly colonial, multicellular organisms like stromatolites, which are just dumb rocks, and we start getting things that you would actually recognize as life. Now, these things would also give you the heebie-jeebies. These were some of the creepiest looking creatures that your, imagine could po your imagination could possibly come up with. But during the Cambrian explosion, we get things like plankton and worms and sponges and trilobites and all sorts of wonderful little tiny creatures that we find in the fossil record. And this is really where life begins to break out and experiment with all sorts of different body types. A lot of the things that are still here today, well, their ancestors started in the Cambrian explosion. M moving on, a couple, about a hundred million years later, we get into the Ordovician period, and this is where we first get land plants. Now, I don't want you to get too excited about these land plants. They weren't that interesting themselves. You're we're talking about things like sphagnum moss, so like the stuff that grows on rocks and in wet environments. Yeah, those were the first land plants, so nothing too crazy yet. For the most part, during the Ordovician, every single bit of land is just open rock. It's, it's dead, desolate wasteland. Nothing living on it at all during the Ordovician. So for three billion years of Earth's history, nothing's living on land, all right? Now, at the end of the Ordovician, and during the Ordovician period, really, you've got different types of fish kind of starting, and the aquatic environment or ecosystem is starting to take off. But at the end of the Ordovician, we end up getting a mass extinction. Now, the cause of this mass extinction is up for debate. <clears throat> a lot of people think it might be due to global cooling. Um, it might have something to do with the fact that land plants are getting on land and they're breaking up new minerals and that's getting flooded into the water. And because everything is living on the coastline during this time, if you get a bunch of algal blooms, it blocks out the sun and everything that's living at the bottom, they don't get the sun they need, they die. Maybe that's what happened. We're not 100% sure, but what we do know is about 60 to 70% of the aquatic species living at the time died at the end of the Ordovician. And that's why we call it the end of the Ordovician. We mark it with that extinction event. Now, moving forward, 419 million years ago, we are in the Devonian period, and this is known as the Age of Fish. Now, fish had already evolved up to this point, but this is where they take off and they dominate the oceans. They become the dominant force in the oceans on planet Earth. We had all sorts of interesting creatures living at this time. Dunkleostasis, I never say that right, is a giant armor-plated fish um, that went around and munched on things. And we actually have fossils of this in the uh, University of Kansas Natural History Museum. They're pretty cool. Um, but think about something about, the, about your size to the size of a car swimming around with bone-plated armor. It was a pretty neat-looking thing and was the big baddie of, of its time. 
Now, just like with the Ordovician, we mark the end of the Devonian period with another mass extinction. This was the second mass extinction in Earth's history. Very similarly to the Ordovician extinction, we think it probably had something to do with the fact that land plants were taking off, unlocking more minerals, causing algal blooms. There are also situations where the continents were moving around and heading further north and south into some of the polar regions, and maybe the change in climate also is responsible for killing things off. There's a lot of debate, but remember, as I said before, we don't have all the pages left behind to figure out the exact answer. We have about a good idea. Um, and point being, at the end of the Devonian, between 70 and 85% of all species died off during this time period. So it was another big whack over the head to life on Earth. Now, after this period, things start to get even more interesting because things on land begin to take off. We start getting the first trees, which is pretty awesome. We start getting things like scale bark trees, which are known as lepidodendrons. I actually have a fossil of those. They're pretty cool. Um, and in the Carboniferous period, so this is after the Devonian, we start getting trees taking off, and trees start taking off everywhere on land. Vast forests as far as the eye can see, super dense forests everywhere. We start getting flying insects. We start getting reptiles in this period as well. And we start to get an environment that looks similar to what the dinosaurs lived in, but not quite. Now here's some of the cool things about the Carboniferous period, and this is why I bring it up. It's called Carboniferous, that carbon part. This is where basically all of the coal on planet Earth came from. It came during this time period. There wasn't a lot of things to break down dead trees. And when these trees fell, they would be covered up with other dead trees and sediment and everything else. They would get buried and they would get turned into coal. And most of our coal deposits, especially here in the United States, came exactly from this time period. <clears throat> so if you have a piece of coal that you're burning in a power plant, well, chances are that's 350 million years old. And you are taking carbon that was taken from the atmosphere then locked up in the body of those trees, and now you're burning it and putting it back in the atmosphere. That carbon that's being released hasn't been in the atmosphere for 300 million years. Pretty crazy, right? Now here's the other cool thing about the Carboniferous period. The Carboniferous is broken up into two subperiods: the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. The Pennsylvanian is actually where most of the rock here in this part of Kansas, here in Bonner Springs and through Wyandotte County and Johnson County, that is where most of the rock here came from. Now, when you look at the rock here, it's all limestone, and that lets you know that Kansas, during this time period, used to be a seaway, almost an ocean, not quite. And during this time period, right where you're sitting watching this video, there might have been 100 plus feet of water above you. Or there might have been about 50 feet of water above you, and all around the ground where you're now standing would have been all sorts of little corals and different filter feeding things and crinoids and all sorts of simple ocean organisms, as well as fish and all sorts of cool things swimming around here. So the Pennsylvanian period here in Kansas was a pretty neat time, and we have all sorts of rock with all sorts of different fossils from that time period for you to go look just down the road. You see a big old piece of limestone, hit it with a rock hammer and take a look inside. You'll find all sorts of cool fossils of the things that used to live right here underwater. So that is the Carboniferous period and that gets us into the Permian. Now the Permian is when we start getting things that looked like dinosaurs, they're pre-dinosaurs. Basically just large reptiles and things that could move fairly quickly. If you were to go back during this time and take a look at the creatures roaming around Earth's surface, you probably would have thought that you were looking at dinosaurs. But there's a few things that paleontologists, you know, use to say, they're not exactly dinosaurs yet, but they're getting there. So basically we have proto-dinosaurs during the Permian and the Earth looks radically different than it did in the Ordovician and the Devonian and the Silurian and all those, okay? We are full on life on land. And the coolest thing about the Permian is really what happened at the end of it. The end Permian extinction was the largest mass extinction in Earth's history. 95% of all life on Earth was wiped out from this event. And the cool thing about it is that it was caused by a supervolcano located in Siberia and Russia that erupted for 500,000 years. 500,000 years. That is a big volcano. And it put so much lava out that it could cover the entire United States a mile thick in magma. That's how big of an eruption this was. And that radically changed the environment here on Earth. 
Temperatures raised as much as 10 degrees Celsius across the planet. The oceans became massive dead zones. If you were alive during this time, it would have been the most frightening and eerie time you could possibly imagine. And again, 95% of everything died. But the good news is, is at the end of the Permian, the 5% of things that were left, by the way, those 5% of things are our ancestors. Everything living today can trace their origins back to those tough 5% that were able to eke it out during the most deadly time period in Earth's history, okay? So right after that, life basically immediately recovers. About a million years later, life is back to where it was. And now we've reached the time of the dinosaurs. We get into the Triassic and Jurassic periods and we start to see a radiation of dinosaurs in every potential area or ecosystem that they could find. You start getting dinosaurs in the water, dinosaurs on land, and dinosaurs in the air. They are everywhere. Now, most of your favorite dinosaurs don't show up until the Cretaceous, like the T-Rex and the Stegosaurus and Triceratops and all those, but there were a lot of really cool creatures that appeared during this time. Now, before I get into the Cretaceous, right at the end of the Triassic period was another mass extinction, and about 70 to 75 percent of things went extinct. But most of the damage occurred in the water, and we have no real good idea of what caused this mass extinction. What we really do know is if you were in the water or near the water, you might have gone extinct. But if you were living on land, you were not impacted by this mass extinction. So we're not 100% sure exactly what caused it, but the dinosaurs were not very much affected by it. Lucky for them, and that's why they continued on into the Cretaceous period, and they had about a 100-200 million year reign as king of, of, of the animals on Earth. <sighs> so the Cretaceous period happens. All the cool stuff that you know and love in terms of dinosaurs were living during the Cretaceous. And another cool thing, another cool fact, is during the Jurassic and, and into the Cretaceous, Kansas was once again underwater. It was the Western Interior Seaway. And we used to have things like mosasaurs and all sorts of cool giant dinosaurs that swam around in those seas that used to be swimming here in Kansas. Now, where you're sitting right now, you would have been a little too far inland to be right at the seaway, but you would have been able to see the seaway sitting on a hill way off in the distance. Basically, western Kansas was a seaway, and the cool thing is, is we still have the chalk deposits left behind from that seaway, and a lot of the coolest fossils you could ever imagine have just been found out in farm fields out in western Kansas from this time period. In fact, we've got one of a tylosaur, which was a mosasaurus, that is in the Natural History of Museum that curls around the entire entryway of that museum. It was a gigantic, it was the size of a school bus, and that was found in a farm field out in western Kansas. So. Twice, Kansas has been home to a seaway for ancient creatures. Once in the Pennsylvanian and once during the Jurassic and Cretaceous. Awesome. So then comes birds during this time period as well. Birds show up sometime around 146 million years ago. And mammals also find their start somewhere in this time period as well. That's debated. It could be around the same time as birds. It could be just a little bit after or before. We're not 100% sure, but it's somewhere in there. So mammals and birds, they're all around during the Cretaceous period at this point, but they haven't taken a dominant role. Dinosaurs are still king. And same thing with flowering plants. Flowering plants are showing up during this time period as well. So there's a lot happening in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Now, thankfully for us, for we mammals and the birds and everything else, a giant meteor, giant meteor, miles wide, hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, hit with such force that it vaporized the limestone rock that it hit, and essentially started the chain reaction that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs and the coming reign of mammals. So we have that giant space rock that killed all the, the dinosaurs to thank for the fact that we are here today. Now during that extinction, that was the last mass extinction on Earth, 75% of everything died. It was a very similar situation to what happened during the Permian. There were some volcanic eruptions during the time that, that led to the extinction along with the impact event. And that impact event caused wildfires all over the world. I want you to think about, it hit the Earth with such force when it vaporized that limestone. That means that's limestone gas and that gets shot up into the upper atmosphere and it rains down as hot rocks and that causes forest fires everywhere. So you get an initial wave of forest fires that kill a ton of things, but now there's no food for the herbivores to eat. 
So the herbivores start to die out, and the sun is being blotted out and from all the dust and everything else, and the smoke from all the wildfires, and that blocks out the sun. And that further kills vegetation, further starving those herbivores. And what ends up happening is the herbivores die first, then the carnivores, because they run out of herbivores to eat, and the things that ended up surviving were either small or had no problem eating dead, rotting carcasses that were floating around in the water and on land. So, um, if you're alive today, chances are your ancestors were able to burrow underground to escape the fires and the heat and all that stuff. Your ancestors were probably also very small, they didn't need many calories to survive because there wasn't much food to go find. Or, in the case of things like alligators, you had no problem just eating whatever rotten flesh was floating around in the water and that's how you survived. So. Our ancestors, thankfully for us, weren't around eating rotten flesh. They were burrowing underground and they were tiny little mammals. Not that tiny, like that tiny, but regardless. Okay, don't worry, I'm almost done. That gets us into basically the Cenozoic period, which is more or less the age of mammals. During this time period, mammals take to the land, they take to the sky, and they take to the ocean. And they fill every ecosystem niche that is available left behind from the dinosaurs who are now dead. This is the time period where life, again, spreads out everywhere and evolves rapidly to fill all of these new niches left behind. During this time period, we start getting megafauna once again, and you start seeing things like giant camels, or woolly mammoths, or giant sloths, or short-faced bears, all sorts of things that used to live here up until just 10,000, 12,000 years ago. During this time period, though, there was also a rapid change in climate. And we went from this warm, balmy, kind of tropic atmosphere globally to a much cooler place. And we move into an ice age and we start to actually get glaciers on the North and South Pole that extended for a large chunk of the planet. In fact, some of those glaciers went as far down as Northern Kansas, where you're sitting now. If you've ever seen those big, giant pink rocks, those pink quartzites that people put at the ends of their driveways, those actually came from up in South Dakota, and they were carried down here by the giant, mile-high, thick things of ice that came from those ice sheets from up in the North Pole. That's how far down those ice sheets came. Those things actually would move like giant bulldozers and bring sediment with them down here. And when they melted, they left behind all the rocks that were locked up in that ice. And that's where all that pink quartzite, those giant boulders that are around here came from. So anyways, point being, Earth got a lot colder, we started getting ice, we entered into an ice age. And we have been in that ice age pretty much um, ever since it got started. During this time period, once things got cool and once we get down to about 2 million years ago, we start seeing our first human ancestors. And during this time, we don't just see our direct human ancestors. There were multiple types of human life on Earth over the course of its history. In fact, they were all living next to each other. There could have been as many five to seven different species of human living in the exact same time period. Things from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens sapiens to um, the Denisovians to the, there's all sorts of different types of humans that were living during this time. We just happen to be the ones who made it through. All the way up until about 12,000 years ago, most of the large megafauna that was here was still around. During this time period, humans start moving out of the Stone Age and start figuring out agriculture and figuring out how to build megalithic structures. During this time, 12,000 years ago, humans have now gone from the continent in Africa and have spread to basically every continent on the planet. That includes South America and North America. Yes, people were here on these continents 12,000 years ago, well before Columbus ever even thought about getting in a ship and sailing around. During this time, we were building megalithic structures, ones that are, well, still evident today. We have the remnants of today. Gunung Padang, which is in the West Java, in West Java of Indonesia, dates back to about 12,500 years, and it's built out of large pillars of stone. Now what's left behind is kind of the ruins. It is 12,500 years old. It's the oldest human-made structure we know of. But it was a large enough structure that really shows you that humans had a culture, they had agriculture by this time, and they understood architecture to some degree. And a lot of these sites, a lot of the megalithic sites that we find during this time, were aligned with different constellations and things in the sky. These people were very good astronomers. And if you go to a different place in Turkey, 12,000 years ago, there was another megalithic site called Gobekli Tepe. And in Gobekli Tepe, we see some of the highest forms of architecture in the ancient world. Things that would match the things built by the Egyptians. Things like the Great Sphinx and the, and, and, and the Great Pyramids and all of those. 
you see pillars that are created by actually carving away all of the stone and leaving the three-dimensional objects behind. This requires a very high level of skill and, and artisanship. You wouldn't get this type of skill from just people or farmers working out or hunter-gatherers. So we had an organized civilization 12,000 years ago. So there was an ancient culture that lived during this time. And in fact, you can even look at the Great Sphinx that is in Egypt was most likely built during this time period as well. And there's been several geologists, people of my ilk, who have gone out and taken a look at the walls that surround the Great Sphinx, the quarry where the, the, the rock was taken to build the Sphinx itself. And you see water erosion, real, legit examples of water erosion. But you all know that Egypt's a desert. The last time there was rain enough to be able to do that to the rock walls around the Sphinx was about 12,000 years ago. So there was a large culture, a possibly a global culture, that was building megalithic sites, that had agriculture, that had architecture, that had astronomy, that had all sorts of skills that we did not think they had back then. And they were building these giant things all over the planet and they disappeared. And they disappeared about the exact same time that all those big megafauna of North America disappeared. And what we're starting to find in the rock layers is evidence of an impact event that happened 12,000 years ago. We just haven't been able to find the crater. However, when we look at the surface of North America and the upper northwestern part of the, the, the country, we see evidence of a massive continent-wide flood, which may indicate that the North American ice sheet, which was a mile thick and covered the entire northern part of the continent, may have been struck and rapidly melted. And what we find are graveyards of giant mammoths with their bones smashed in half, their skulls smashed into bits, and all of them in these mass grave sites. And we wonder what may have done that. Not humans. We're not snapping mammoth bones. What likely happened was they were carried away in a massive flood and smashed up against the cliff faces from the current, from this giant flood that occurred. And the funny thing is, is all of these megalithic sites all were either buried or abandoned at this exact time when, when we get this evidence of a meteor or cometary impact. It coincides with the loss of all those large species of mammoths and short-faced bears and giant three-toed sloths and giant camels and all of the things that used to be here. They all disappeared about the exact same time. Now, it's a mystery that we're still uncovering, and the information I have given you is preliminary, but it is beginning to build into a very strong narrative of how we ended this last glacial period of our current ice age. Yes, you right now are in an ice age. In fact, we've had multiple ice ages in Earth's history. We've had five major ice ages. We've had the Huron, which was about 2.4 to 2.1 billion years ago. We had the Cryogenian, which was about 715 to 547 million years ago. And that one was almost like an entire planet of ice. Like that was a big deep freeze. Then we moved into the Andean Saharan Ice Age, about 450 to 420. The Karoo, 360 million years ago. And then we get into the one that we have been in. So there's been quite a few ice ages. But if you look at those dates, most of Earth's history, we've actually been much warmer than we are now. The age of the dinosaurs, the Jurassic and Triassic and Cretaceous and the Permian and that whole chunk of time, it's 200 plus million years, we were warmer than we were today. In fact, most of Earth's history, we've been warmer than we are today and most of Earth's history, we've had life. Now, how fast we shift our temperatures here on Earth makes a big difference. If you go back and look at those Ordovician and the Devonian uh, mass extinctions, it's very likely that rapid onset climate change is what caused it. Permian extinction, well, it was rapid onset climate change just in the hot direction that caused that mass extinction. When you look at the Cretaceous, it's a good chance that rapid onset climate change also had something to do with that extinction on top of all the other factors. So we don't want rapid shifts in Earth's temperature, but it is important to note that life has no problem living here on Earth at higher temperatures and higher CO2 levels. We just have to go into it gradually so as not to cause a mass extinction. Because I'm telling you right now, folks, no one wants to live through a mass extinction here on Earth. It's not a fun time to be around. Anyways, that's the history of Earth. That's a really long video. There's a lot to talk about, as you can see, and I barely glossed over some of the most important details. So this week, I'm going to challenge you to pick two topics, I don't care what they are, about the history of Earth, and I want you to delve into them a little more deeply. We all can't go through all the same stuff, and really, what's important in the history of Earth is really subjective. So since it's subjective, Let's make the assignment and the study of it subjective this week. 
If any of the things I've talked about today are interesting to you, go into them. If there's another time period in Earth's history that you'd like to research, another big event, well, that's what you get to do this week. Hopefully, we can get deep into a small segment of Earth's history and you can come away with a little bit more appreciation for all the stuff that's happened. All right, this was much too long. Thank you for listening.